All right, so now we're recording. Uh, thank you all for being here in the 8th session in the systematic reviews uh, uh, well, seminar series. This 1 will be on quality assessment. So we're coming to the end of the whole series and here is within the context of. Um, the rest of the, the series where we are all the things we've covered and really only the 2 topics that are left to cover uh, in the series. So. Um, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, we're having this one at, uh, normally the schedule would have put this one for, uh, next week, but obviously the Wednesday before Thanksgiving isn't a good time. So I wanted to move this up and the final session will be on December 8th. Um, So the basic outline of what we're going to be talking about is this, what is risk of bias? What does that even mean? Um, that's really the kind of the basis of quality assessment of articles, some of the different tools to use, and then how risk of bias is typically reported. We'll look at, I'll show you an example of that from a published systematic review to get, so you get a sense of the typical presentation of, of how risk of bias shows up. So the one thing that I want to say though is, um, Quality assessment isn't necessarily going to be a part of the review that you perform. So there are many systematic reviews um, that uh, do not, you won't see quality assessment as part of it. And scoping reviews, if you're doing that, that's typically not part of a scoping review. So this is not, you know, all the other steps we talked about are part and parcel of doing these reviews. You're going to do a data extraction, you're gonna do screening, all that sort of thing. The part you may not do is the quality assessment. And so just to kind of put that out there that this is not always part of, of the process. So like I said, risk of bias is the basis of quality assessment. So it's determining the risk of bias in the study. So what you're doing when quality assessment, much like it's part of the data, it's sort of part of the data extraction uh, process, you've ran the searches, you've run the searches for your articles, you've collected all your articles, you put them into whatever program, Covidence, uh, you've deduplicated, you've done your title and abstract screen, then of those that made it through that, you've done the full text screen, and then of those that make it through that, that's the, that's the body of articles that you're going to analyze. And it's that body of articles to which you're going to apply the data extraction that we talked about last week and the perhaps the quality assessment, which we're going to talk about this week. You're determining in the quality of assessment risk of bias. So risk of bias is defined according to Cochrane as a systematic error of deviation from the truth. You can't directly measure bias. Um, what you're measuring is the likelihood of it occurring based on the methodologies used. And so the analysis that you do for quality assessment is to review, say for an RCT that you're including in your study, you're gonna review the methodologies they use as described in the article, in the method section of the article, you're going to apply a range of rules to it and determine the likelihood of the risk of bias. So really it's, do the conditions exist, which make bias more or less likely? You can't, again, you can't measure that bias occurred or, um, uh, you know, you're measuring whether the conditions exist in which bias is more or less likely. So I'll just leave it at that. One issue with this is that this analysis is highly dependent on what authors choose to report. Um, and so when we look at the examples of risk of bias, we'll see that um, there's a lot of unknowns. So they may say there's a high risk, there's a low risk, there's an unknown or indeterminate risk because the authors may not have provided enough information for you to determine the risk of bias. So those are really the three answers that you'll see, high risk, low risk, or can't determine, indeterminate risk of bias um, when not enough information has been provided. All right, so that's the general gist of what risk of bias is. 
looking at some sort of systematic deviation from the truth. We can't measure it directly. We can't say that bias occurred, but do the conditions, the conditions described in the methodology, would those conditions make bias more or less likely? So there is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. So this is maybe the, the most uh, commonly used one. So there's the ROB2, the Risk of Bias tool for randomized trials. And so I'm gonna go to Covidence. Uh, so co we've talked about Covidence quite a bit throughout this process. <clears throat> Let me move some things around here and we'll look at a practice guideline here, or a practice project here. And again, title abstract, full text review. This is part of the extraction stage. So I click here and I say, okay, I still have to extract articles. The extraction is done in two parts. So I'm gonna, we'll come back to this one that I quote unquote extracted already, but we'll look at an unextracted article in Covidence. It will say begin extraction. Um, so I go here. And there are two parts to the extraction. One is the data extraction, which is what we talked about last time, but you'll see this other tab, which is the quality assessment. And the default for Covidence is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool for randomized trials. So these items that you're answering, high, low, unsure, have to do with the proper development of a randomized control trial. These are things you would wanna look at. So sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding of participants, blinding of outcome assessment. How do they treat incomplete data? Selective reporting, all that sort of thing. Um, so if we go back, you can see there's a template here. So we, I showed you the data extraction template and how to make use of that. Uh, last time, there's similarly one for quality assessment. And again, it's the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool is the default, but as always, I can um, delete items or add in new items if I want. Um, so you see how I can add and subtract items from this because that's an issue here is this is based on the use of this tool the, for randomized trials. But again, that's what it looks like within Covidence. Um, go to the extraction, and then here's one where, the, this is one that I've extracted and done a quality assessment of. I did a very cursory job just to show what it looks like in Covidence when two people have extracted. So this is what I showed you last time that, you know, the two reviewers, which are both me, just different email accounts, uh, extract the paper and then, Covidence looks for, okay, you didn't agree on this, decisions required. You did agree on this, so you're good to go. No answer is given, decision required. You agreed, no problem. You disagreed, need a decision. Same with quality assessment. Um, you can see they're both reviewers, so this is just totally random. Um, both reviewers said hi, okay, so you're done. For allocation concealment, one said high, one said low. So which of these judgments are you gonna use? One said unsure, one said high. Which of these judgments are you gonna use? This is where you'd have a process in place where you'd either have a third reviewer who would break the tie, or you would have a process by which the two reviewers would sit down and talk it through and come up with what is the final judgment? Is it unsure or is it high? Uh, and so that is what Covidence is tracking. Um, and so that is the consensus process in the extraction, begin to develop a consensus. So when neither, if it needs to be extracted, it says begin extraction. Once both reviewers, and maybe if you have it set at two, you could set it that each article needs to be extracted by two people, three people, four people. Um, whenever it reaches that threshold, you'll have this begin the consensus process. And that's where you're gonna to have to have a process in place for how are you going to um, deal with um, disagreements. All right, so that's kind of the Covidence part. That's what it looks like in Covidence. So I always like to show what it looks like in Covidence because Covidence is a great piece of software that really streamlines the process. Um, but again, it defaults to this tool, which may not be appropriate, which brings us to 
oh, so this domains to consider for RCTs, these are the things that it's asking for. So this is how you evaluate the quality of a randomized control trial is through these elements. And there's, uh, through like the Cochrane manual, there's discussion of what each of these things means and how you identify high or low risk. Um, so for instance, for random number generation, it defines low risk if you use a random number generator. This is to, for a randomized control trial, which patients are gonna go in which arm? Are they gonna get the control or are they gonna get the uh, experimental treatment? Low risk random number generation would be drawing cards, flipping a coin, uh, or random number generator. High risk would be either chosen by the clinician or participant themselves, or doing it by day of visit or birth date, which to be honest, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why that's high risk, but that's always, they always list that as being a high risk. If uh, which arm of the study you go into is determined by your birth date or day of visit, that's high risk. So I'm not sure what, how exactly that is, but that's how they define it. So they'll give you the description and you, the idea is that I'm gonna read the methodology and try to figure out how they did this. And they may not tell me, uh, there's a good chance they're not going to tell me. So I could either follow up with the authors or I can just say it's uncertain. So the obvious question at this point, well, what if it's not an RCT? So that we looked at the risk of bias tool from Cochrane, which is designed for RCTs. But if you look at these elements, you know, if we're talking about a case control study, there's not random sequence generation. There's not blinding of participants. Like uh, most of these things are not appropriate for other study types. So this would be a useless tool for evaluating the quality of say a qualitative study or some other type of experimental design other than a randomized control trial. So there are other tools, uh, other tools to be used to identify risk of bias. There's a lot of tools. I've just showed some of the common ones. So the Newcastle Ottawa tool, that's for case control studies. So it's a different set of questions that allow you to determine the uh, quality of a case control study. Or there's the JBI checklist. So Joanna Briggs Institute checklist for evaluating qualitative research. So looking for risk of bias in a qualitative study. Um, or this Robin's eye tool of risk of bias in non-randomized studies of interventions. And there's many, many more. Uh, if you go through the literature and look at systematic reviews, you'll see a whole variety of tools. These, the Cochrane risk of bias and the Newcastle are two very common ones you'll come across, but there's a lot of other tools that people use, which again, are, are like the Cochrane risk of bias tool. It's a series of questions that help you to determine the likelihood of bias. Okay, so that's, you have to find the right tool for the, to match your article type. So one of the final things I wanna talk about is reporting risk of bias. So this is, I just picked a random, um, oh, sorry, let me see. It looks like there's a question. Uh, so if you're not going to do one, do you need to state that? I don't I feel like in what I've seen is people just don't mention it. Um, I don't know if there's a best practice with that. Uh, I don't know that I've come across it too many times of someone saying we didn't do it and here's why. I feel like typically they just don't do it. Um, this might be one of look at some published ones and see how they handle the topic, if at all. I don't know that there's one best practice for that. Uh, if you're not gonna do a quality assessment, do you have to address the fact that you didn't do it? Um, it's a good question, and I don't know if there's a standard answer for that. Um, but it's a good question uh, to think about. I, I actually don't know the answer. Um, so, inter so this was a systematic review I pulled out uh, just to show how quality assessment is reported. Um, so this intervention for preventing type 2 diabetes in adults with mental disorders in low and middle income countries. So this was a Cochrane systematic review. So a Cochrane, you know, one that makes it as a Cochrane systematic review, it meets the highest standards. And so there's always going to be a quality assessment, I think, in a, in a Cochrane risk of bias or Cochrane review. 
um, and you can see the two ways they reported it. So this was looking at RCTs, because you can see they use the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool for randomized trials. You can see these elements, they're the same elements that I mentioned before for the ROB2 tool. And what they've done is they've looked at all the articles and they've done an assessment. So for all the articles they looked at, what percentage of them had a low risk of bias, which had unclear and which had a high risk of bias. So this is considering across all the articles, I don't remember the number, but let's say there's 20 articles that made it to the end. You know, 55, 60% of them had low risk of random sequence generation bias, whatever percent, 35 or 35 percent had unclear and five percent had high risk of bias and they so they go through each of the elements to show the likelihood of bias um, across all the studies they looked at so that's sort of a, a collective analysis then they will also do an individual analysis each of these is an individual article the author and the year and then for each of the elements and i'm sorry it always looks like this where the the writing is uh you know, horizontal like that. So it's, it's tough to read. You know, if I turn it 90 degrees, it'll make this part hard to read. So it's, this is the way they, these always look. Um, and they report for each element. So green is low risk, red is high risk. But remember I said, oftentimes the authors don't provide enough information to accurately assess the risk of bias. And so that's what these question marks are. So you can see kind of a preponderance of question marks here that's not unusual at all to see that for most articles a good number of these are just question marks there's not enough information provided to determine the risk of bias um, but that's just part of the analysis um, so this is typically how it's reported if you're interested in sort of graphically what it looks like in an article when you report the risk of bias all right so um, that was what I had to talk about. So we talked about risk of bias, what it is, and it's systematic deviation from the truth. Uh, risk of bias is not directly measurable. However, you can identify if the conditions exist in which risk of bias is highly likely or uh, has a low likelihood, or there's not enough information and it's an unknown risk of bias. There's different tools for measuring this. You know, the one we looked at the most during the session was the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, but that's appropriate for a certain type of study. It is not appropriate and would be useless for other types of studies, case control studies or cohort studies or qualitative research. So you have to find the right tool for the right study design. Um, that's point two. And then how those are reported, it typically looks like those graphs that I showed you or those uh, tables that I showed you in the prior slide, that's a pretty typical representation of quality assessment in a published systematic review. Um, but again, and I think this was alluded to in the question I received was, you will not always do a quality assessment. Um, you know, all the other elements we talked about are pretty standard. You're going to do those things. You know, you're going to extract the data, you're going to screen the articles, et cetera. In a scoping review, you'll almost never see quality assessment, and in many systematic reviews, you won't see a quality assessment. So, uh, but it's an important thing to be aware of that that exists. Um, so that was what I had. So the next and final session of this series uh, will be Wednesday, December 8th. And that will be on writing a manuscript and getting published. So it'll be, as always, Wednesday at noon in this WebEx. Um, let me look up the, uh, sorry, I want to share the guide for this series because that's where the recordings end up. So I'm sorry, let me look this up. So the recording for this session, when it becomes available to me, I will post in this guide and I'll post my slides into this guide. Um, let me go ahead and put this in the chat. So there is the series guide. Um, I'm going to turn off the recorder. Stop.